had vague plans that like, oh yeah, I'll get on and get us like iron gear and stuff so that we don't have to start off the queer cast in the middle of the night with mobs around and nothing. Creeper and yet here we are. Hi, Creeper. No, 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 no. Uh, the chickens. Well, I got stone, wood, and food at once, so I I'd say that that was uh, fairly productive, <laughs> actually. Hey, okay, Kay Laurel, I've just seen your new outfit. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll put a lot of work into that. Yeah. Ah, Skillington. Ah, uh, yes. It'll be so much easier if we just record Minecraft at the same time. I don't know who thought of that. I mean, in my defense, it will be easier just once we have stuff. I, I like your optimism. Oh, food. That'll be good. I'm pretty, pretty proud of the optimism, actually. We're here. We're queer. We have things to say about neurodivergence. Apple, I'm going to eat your brethren. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're not eating my brethren, we're fine. Dead careful. That? Not dying. How okay, well, the creeper was still alive in the daytime. Have they changed the rules on me again? Dead, dead creepers aren't undead. They don't burn. They've never burned. Yeah. So the question is, how seriously do I take the Minecraft? Not at all. Minecraft is there as a tool to help you not be bored. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, some, you, you said words. I don't quite understand what they mean. Minecraft is for fidgeting. Creeper, 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 ah. creeper! <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me, we're trying to film an intro, Creeper. See, this is the kind of Minecraft content I want to see. I'll start. I'm really good at doing intros. Yay! Heck yeah. Go. Hi, I'm Mush... Wait, I'm going to start again. Hi, I'm Mush Toom. I'm a 20-year-old autistic and ADHD content creator who makes a lot of Minecraft content over on my channel. And I'm really excited to hang out with these people and talk about some stuff that is really important to me today. So, yeah. Hello. I'm Apple Averis. I do mostly Minecraft things. I'm 19. Never hey. fucking learned how to read. <laughs> ADHD. Only 19, but my mind is older. She's doing her 20, so she's getting colder. She's older. older. <laughs> We're not going to get anything done. We're just going to mess around. I'm Shea Laura. I, this is my channel. I brought people together because I want to talk about cool stuff and because I really think that we should use our platforms to educate people in the things we wished we had learned online. So I'm doing that. And I brought my father along because my father actually has training in this stuff. It wasn't my fault. I just ended up here. That didn't yeah. go well. Hi, I'm Joshua, also known as Pantera in some circles. I do mental health videos. I'm a social worker mm -hmm. by qualification and I am a one-on-one -on -one therapist. And the vast majority of the people I work with are ADHD, autism combinations, sometimes just autism, sometimes just ADHD, mostly both. And on top of that, I try to uh, help the people know around the world what actually I think should be common knowledge, which too few people have. Yeah. You're not so big in the Minecraft scene, but you do some YouTube stuff. I, I have played Minecraft at least once. Yeah, I don't have to tell you how to punch down a tree, but I do have to tell you that creepers don't burn in sunlight. So that's where we're at here. Uh, Every couple of years I come back to Minecraft and they've changed all the rules on me. Yeah, I love that yeah. they keep doing that. It, it, every day it's a new fun game. And also look, we have glaciers. Isn't that funky? I'm Oh, I mean, okay, hey, we're going to get a whole big change coming up real soon. Oh my gosh. What, yeah. November 30th? We are. Is it? Yep, Is November it 30th, 30th. They announced it. I'm oh my gosh. I'm so excited. I wonder if this video will be out before then. <laughs> or if everyone's going to be how like. How long the last one? Uh, probably not. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> In my defense, that was because it deleted itself and I had to spend an extra week on it. That's doing right. it from scratch. Ooh. Which was totally my fault. Why was That's it your rough. fault? You can't just shoulder blame for that one. I'm, I'm always guilty for everything. I mean, with great power comes great responsibility. Oh, look, there's a cat. And uh, with great responsibility <laughs> comes the uh, ability to take ownership of everyone else's problems, right? Ah, oh, yes, my favorite Uncle Ben quote. Oh, look, there's a cat. <laughs> Very important content. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I got some iron. So th the whole point of us doing, like, the Minecrafting is so that I don't have to spend six extra hours recording Minecraft content in the background. <laughs> Oh, you poor thing. Valid. I haven't recorded six hours of Minecraft. How did you manage to survive that? <laughs> you Sorry. have a fair point, Sorry. but I'd like you to stop talking. <laughs> oh, dear. Poor YouTube content creators uh, for Minecraft having to record Minecraft. It's a hard world. I, it, it's not the recording. 
It's not the recording that's the issue. It's the editing. It's the editing. It's six extra it hours of footage. Oh, I found a cave. Mush also found a cave. There are zombies down there. There's a lot of zombies down here, actually. I'll tell you so, what, you just aggro all the zombies. <laughs> so, did anyone else do the readings? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, no, I never do the readings. That's why I dropped out of uni. I dropped out of college because I'm hot. I mean, it, it is a system that isn't really built for us. No, it really they, isn't. They try. Well, that's debatable. Effectively, universities were created by the people who were upwardsly thinking and capable, and bit by bit, they tried to make it more mainstream. So the odds are that the first universities were created for strange people who spent their time thinking and talking about philosophies and stuff. So mm. kind of it was built for us. And then they changed the system on us. Well, they tried mm. to make it accessible for everyone, which since there's more neurotypical people, that's neurologically typical or common people, then there are neurologically different people, since typical is the biggest group. Mm -hmm. They made it as compatible as possible for the biggest group, which is not necessarily us. That makes sense. That makes sense. Just that makes sense, but by sense. golly. So annoying. By golly, is it annoying? Yeah. I mean, they want us to be inclusive and then they exclude us. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Our campus believes in inclusivity. We do anything that we can in order to make sure everyone feels at home here. Except if you're neurodivergent, mm. fuck you. That's the energy that I get from most places around me. Yeah, I had real troubles with a class that was preaching on and on about how we don't know the experiences that each individual in our classroom has gone through we don't know what's going on in their lives so we try not to assume all the while i was really struggling to pay attention to their teaching methods because they were assuming that i was neurotypical and i could not keep up and i was getting mm. caught on little inconsistencies and so not able to string them together because that thing you said isn't actually how it works can you tell me how it actually works mm. Oh, well, but didn't you just assume the same information that everyone else had? No, because you just told me not to assume things. And also because uh, I don't do that. And didn't you get the memo that we don't do it that way? You know, the one that we just assumed you knew? <sighs> so Hannah Gadsby, an absolutely amazing comedian from Australia, Tasmania, the little island at the bottom. Yes. Uh, yes, that is actually part of our country, not New Zealand. Sorry, New Zealand. Uh, Hannah Gadsby has this beautiful part about, um, in one of her comedies available on Netflix, that she talks about how she always feels like she's missed the memo. That everyone seems to know what's going on, but they didn't send her a memo to tell her. And uh, so I think that's a fantastic way of putting how most neurotypicals just have an inherent intuitive understanding of what's going on and why the rules apply now, but not then. And she always feels like she's behind. Yeah, she's got some really good stuff on autistic experiences, not just telling you, but she manages to, I think, kind of craft a story so that the audience can see what she was experiencing. Anyway, so that's the assigned reading for this. Everyone go away and watch some Hannah Cats. You know. Uh, gotcha. <laughs> the I wouldn't first mind was that reading. She's funny. She's great. Right. Between that, Lynette uh... and Douglas, she found out she was autistic. Yep. So it's quite interesting seeing the difference in how she puts the information across. That kind of ties back into what I wanted to say earlier. Part of the big reason why I dropped out of college was because I found it impossible to make myself do things that I did not want to do, mm -hmm. which was 99% of the things that I needed to do to pass my classes. Not helpful for continuing yep. college. <laughs> I, I never yeah. did the readings. Actually, I did one of the readings once, and I forced myself through one of the readings once, purely by changing my Discord status every time I read a new page, so that my Discord status was up with the amount of pages that I had, and my friends would message me every now and then, like, hey, only this many more pages to go. One um, of the challenges for ADHD brains is the distance between when you do a thing and when you get rewarded for it, and neurotypicals generally go with bigger gaps, and so when they set up a system to reward you for doing something the gap is too large and so you lose the dopamine reward that powers your motivation to do things mm. so if you can add quick rewards along the way then that makes it a lot easier <laughs> to get this done mm. Are you sure this is a good idea recording this while playing <laughs> minecraft and getting blown up by creepers yeah 
Okay. I'm glad to hear that. If it anyway. doesn't work, we won't do it next time. Also assigned uh, readings for anyone that isn't aware of it. How to ADHD by Jessica McCabe. Amazing channel. Lots of good tips. Lots of good content there for ADHD. I know for me, the one reason that I really, really struggled in college was I was also grappling with the fact that I had just been diagnosed with ADHD. I hadn't had my autism diagnosis at the time, but I was diagnosed at the age of 20 and had to try and deal with that battle alone without the support from the university. How did you go with, once they, once the university knew, did they know? Did you get support? Yeah. What was the support? They were like, oh, we will offer, you know, how, okay, it's different in America, I feel like, than other places. And in America, the whole kind of thing is you don't get support. They're just kind of like, if you really need it, they might give you like this one special kind of thing. But if you are passing your classes and they don't see a reason for you to need any help, then you will not get help. Yes. That's annoying. Yeah. Which is not okay and is not fun in the slightest. So mm. that's why I wasn't diagnosed until I was 20 because I had the grades. I had the good behavior. I didn't express the typical traits for ADHD and autism that you would typically see in boys. Because again, there's not a lot of research done on, you know females who are diagnosed with ADHD and autism. And so mm -hmm. I struggled for the longest time. How did that kill me? I was locked away. Did, oh, did it get you through a corner? It got me through a corner. That's, That's it. Th how dare they? I think there's going to be a lot of squirreling in this episode. Where I am, there are not a lot of supports for people like us. It took years for me to get diagnosed once I had a suspicion and they didn't really do much. Mm -hmm. All of the support that I kind of got was honestly from TikTok, believe it or not. Yes. I it definitely from, do believe it. Yeah, people who are openly talking about their experiences, even though you have to fact check with those kind of things mm -hmm. uh, because it's not always accurate. It definitely makes made me feel less alone during the whole thing. That's Something that good. no one in real life would have been able to do. Which is really great. I am very, very lucky in that because of my father, I knew I wasn't alone. I've known my whole life that I wasn't truly alone, even if I couldn't find other people, like out and about in the wild, that thought like me, felt like me, experienced the world in the way I did. I was lucky enough to know that I wasn't alone. I'm yeah. glad that I could give you that because uh, loneliness was a big part of my experience. Yeah, and I've been able to reach out to my friends and help them understand themselves too. I have so many friends who are like, you are the reason I understand my own brain, which I think is, is pretty funky. And it kind of mm -hmm. sucks that they didn't understand their own brains until I was like, oh yeah, that's the thing I do. I'm glad that I could help them. A lot of that's what inspired me to go into therapy, not only to actually try and understand my own brain. So I did some actual therapy therapy with therapists to try to get my own moods under control, get my own perspective back to something that was reasonably normal. And then I found that I just kept helping people and then I wanted to actually get some qualifications to do it more formally. And uh, I fell into one-on-one -on -one therapies with people who were struggling and the vast majority of them, strangely enough, have uh, neurodivergence. So helping them understand their experience and regulate their own moods and mm. see the world as it mostly truly is rather than how their dysregulated moods are reporting it was very useful and also helping the people who would find medication helpful get to that medication. Yeah, medication is very helpful for the people it actually helps. That, uh, and some journey. people can manage without medication and do okay, but uh, there are some people who cannot manage without medication. So it mileage will vary uh, strangely enough uh, everything's spectrum and where you are on the medication spectrum whether you don't need it it would be helpful to improve your quality of life or you can't function with that it will depend on you and your unique situation yep i like using the glasses analogy some people don't need glasses at all congratulations well done some people need it just to read some people need to drive some people need it all the time which set which type of glasses are best for you that depends on what you're right for needing mm. And sometimes glasses don't help because uh, that's not the problem your eyes have. Yeah, that's a really good analogy, I think. Yeah. Feel free to steal it. I did. One of my favorite things to do, uh, as somebody who was diagnosed very late, like a lot later than mm -hmm. a lot of people, I love talking, not late in life. That's what I nearly said there. 
as somebody who was diagnosed <laughs> um, in adulthood rather than in childhood, I do love talking about the difference between experiences with that, as well as just learning about it for myself. But I don't know when everyone here figured this stuff out. Uh, 40. I was 40 years old. A few months ago. <laughs> A few uh, months ago. <laughs> Earlier this year. I you always knew that I wasn't the normal. I just didn't know what part of not normal I was. I didn't know the words or the coping mechanisms. I have words for it recently. I guess pretty much the same time Dad realized what words applied. I was like, ah, yes, well, I know that my brain works in the same way as yours does. So I guess if those words apply to you, they probably apply to me too, and I should look into that. Yeah, mo mostly I knew that I wasn't neurotypical, I just didn't have the words to figure out what I actually was. Yeah, and because you and I, Shay Laura, don't present how people expect neurodivergent people to present, uh, for the most part, partly because we are so um, verbose, educated, <laughs> capable, and functional for the most part, it was clear that it was neurodivergent, but what kind? Mm. What was the right labels? And the more I learned about autism and ADHD, the more I realized, oh, that's us. There was a bunch of different conditions I was also looking into at the time, which sort of were adjacent, but not right. And so once I'd worked out where I sat on things, and it was a case of sharing that information with you and seeing where you were at. Yeah. I meant that you also got a fairly late diagnosis. One of the things that strikes me is the more I look back into my childhood, knowing what I know now, the more obvious it was what the heck was going on mm -hmm. and the more frustrated I am that all these professionals that I met, therapists, teachers, psychs, okay. psychiatrists, hospital staff, didn't have a clue. Why. And when you compare notes with other people and it's like, oh yeah, all of us got like, has great potential, but needs to steer stuff, needs to actually put themselves into the work. Like we Just all have apply great yeah. potential, needs to apply themselves. Every ADHD person I know has that on their report card. At the point that you keep writing that teachers, does it not occur to you to get this person checked for ADHD? Do you not know that that's what you're saying? And the answer something is no, is, they don't. Something that always annoyed me is sometimes there are very visual things that can signal that maybe somebody isn't neurotypical. For instance, I walk on my toes mm -hmm. and I found out just this year that apparently that is a sign of autism. I found and... out from you and I was like, wait, that explains <laughs> so much. I know, because everyone throughout oh, my entire arms. life, yeah, it's like the T-Rex arms, but like mm. everyone has said during my, throughout my entire life, um, like called me out for walking on my toes. Oh, you better not do that. You're going to need surgery. Oh, that's so weird. Why do you do that? I'm going to name you Twinkle Toes. But mm. no one knew, no one made the connection that that could be potentially something connected to my brain, to how my brain works to autism and that pisses me off beyond yeah. all regard understandable i don't know about you guys but i definitely had a little bit of i'm not like other girls syndrome very mm -hmm. much so and that wasn't because i thought lesser of other people which is what most people who have the i'm not like other girls um vibe yeah. feel. it is that there was literally something different about me than the other like girls in my class and the other boys in my class yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and it was it was autism. We've previously talked and about ADHD. yes, in in these quick us we've previously talked about the misogyny that comes with mm. the oh, but I'm not like other girls. But because I was talking with a bunch of either neurotypicals or neurodivergent people who haven't realized that they're neurodivergent yet, not sure on that one. Not my place to cry. But we didn't get to talk about that when you're actually different to all of the people around you when you actually are operating on, I, my brain wants to say different operating system. You're running a different operating system. Which I've means, actually used that analogy yeah. a few times to explain to people. It's like um, uh, most of the world is Microsoft and I'm an Apple and I can communicate fairly effectively through the internet with you through that third party medium, but I can't really connect directly to you. And so whenever I have to uh, sh share a document with you or uh, information, I have to remember to save it in the format that your computer can take it. Mm -hmm. 
the format I prefer is a bit more efficient, a little bit nicer, less prone to errors. But then when I translate it to you, there's all sorts of problems. And did, did, did the picture stay where it was supposed to stay? Um, yeah. So yeah. computer different operating systems is a good way of putting it. But that only really works for the nerdy types. To add to that analogy with like video production kind of stuff is like yes. some people who record their stuff on OBS and haven't changed their system so that it saves as like an MP4 or an MOV and it's still saving as like, a, oh MKV. Shoot, like an MV. MKV. Yes. There is the kind of people who will make sure to make that change. And that would be the analogy for the people who are neurodivergent, who are making the change to make it palatable for the others. And then there is the people who have to change it after the fact, right? Yep. Yep. You and said the you're... people that then, instead of changing it, they're like, mm, that's the wrong file. Give me the right one. Yep. You do <laughs> because the that's the kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's like... Because neurotypical people don't like to accommodate for neurodivergent people or learn that we uh, operate differently. Instead of being accommodating for that or understanding, give me the right file. Like, yeah. yeah. Or they just G don't know. Like, they've never seen an MKV file before mm -hmm. and they just know that when they tried to put that in their editing software, it was like, mm, I can't process this. So they're like, uh, I, I, some, something's gone on. Can you give me, like, something that actually works? Because this is a brand new experience for them. I'm going to make up some numbers, but I think if neurotypical people put about 5% more effort into being a bit more accepting and understanding and accommodating, it would save so many traumatic problems for neurodivergent people, whereas neurodivergent people have to do 90% accommodation for the neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. It's just hard. So not only are you exhausted because you're trying to do lots of, you know, self adjustment for a society that you don't fit in, but you're also having to do a huge amount of overhead whenever you talk to a neurotypical person to make sure you're putting information in the format that they can understand, accept, and isn't too traumatic or difficult for them to comprehend. Yeah. Which means that I know your that I... own process you go ahead. is slowed down because you're trying to do this interpretation layer on top of what they're talking about. And so sometimes they will consider that you are dumb, behind, retarded, not very smart, when actually you're just exhausted or having to think way too many things. Yeah, and then those words become really harmful mm -hmm. because yep. they're used to oppress people. I know that um, I have lost many friends due to this kind of thing where they are neurotypical and they don't quite understand uh, the difference that I have, except the difference between me and somebody else is I'm very big on communication and asking for people to change harmful behaviors if they mm -hmm. are harming me. Uh, not placing blame or anything, but being like, hey, it would really help me if you didn't do these things. Uh, because it's really negatively impacting my mental health. You know, that's supposed to be a two-way kind of thing, but that's not the point here. The point is that the second a neurotypical person hears that, but doesn't understand it for themselves in their own context, most of the time, they say you're asking for too much, or they mm. say you are too much, and they just don't seem to want to put in that extra time to make us feel human. <laughs> And that's not all neurotypicals, but yeah, there's way too many of them. I just wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that the token neurotypicals listening to this don't feel that uh, we are picking on a whole lot. There are people that do some yeah. beautiful accommodation of thoughts and considerations, which is wonderful. If you're watching this and you're neurotypical, that just shows me that you go and you do some research about this stuff, and you are probably a very wonderful ally to us. Yes. So, thank you. You might have clicked on this thinking, ooh, funny Minecraft video, and then when we started talking about serious brains and you stuck around yeah at, at, at that point you're here for a reason and we're not asking for huge differences we're asking for a bit of understanding and one of those understandings is that each neurodivergent person you meet is a different neurodivergent person you've met mm -hmm. one of the advantages of being neurotypical is that the differences between you and the next neurotypical person are fairly small whereas the differences between each neurodivergent person is actually fairly large. So there is more understanding and education you may need to do in order to be able to be more inclusive. Mm. But wouldn't it be nice to be inclusive? I don't quite understand, and this might just be an autistic thing, but I don't quite understand why people have such a hard time putting in that little extra energy to make everything more inclusive. Mm. Um, especially since I feel like we do that every day, trying to make them feel like more comfortable around us. I suspect it's an efficiency thing in that with the consideration <laughs> that uh, neurodivergent uh, people are the minority. 
Sorry. I'm not trying to interrupt. I'm just watching Shape Final Word of Mobs. I was doing a great job, <laughs> I okay? I was so efficient with that. Hush you. Please continue. Sorry. So because neurotypicals uh, dominate, and they don't dominate as much as most people think, roughly one third of people are close enough in statistics to each other that we call them typical, the average, that the normal people. Roughly another third are different enough from them that you can categorize them separately, but accommodating for neurotypical behaviors and ways of being is easy enough that they don't struggle in this society, but given mm -hmm. half a chance, they would change a few things. And then you've got the neurodivergent people, which which is roughly one third of the population. Because that one third of the population is made up of hundreds of different subtypes, there is no single adjustment that will help the most. Yeah. Whereas the neurotypicals have a nice little, uh, well, look, most of us like it this way, so how about that? An example I can give for that is the frequency that they pitch vacuum machines. At, oh. So vacuum or Hoover for some countries. There's a particular sound frequency that they're allowed to have and a certain loudness they're allowed to have, and that's considered safe and normal and acceptable. And for many people, they're okay with that. There's quite a few neurodivergent people though, who cannot stand that frequency and all the loud volume. And all we'd have to do is change the frequency a bit and the volume a bit to be more inclusive, but do you change the frequency up? or down. And that will depend on your neurodivergent person, which one's better. Mm. The volume though, well, they're trying to make it as quiet as they can and still powerful. So they've had to pick a sort of medium. So the expectation is that if you have troubles with vacuum cleaning, put on headphones, put on sound cancelling headphones, muffling or music or something to compensate. But that's up to you to fix the problem, not society. Yeah. Now, if the vacuum cleaners were pitched at a frequency like fingernails down a chalkboard, the manufacturers, which change the frequency because mm -hmm. most neurotypicals would not like it and so they would not buy that brand and most of society has been unconsciously formed in this method which frequencies which colors which textures do most people not mind and therefore that's what we sell it takes extra thought to go hmm you know there's a few people that really don't like this particular one version or thing so why don't we find something that everyone likes well that's impossible so we just go for the biggest chunk that's quick that's efficient that's cheap you and can't that's please everyone. That's the society we've ended up with, which yeah. often means we have to make the accommodation. If you have that problem with the frequency, you put on the headphones. Part of me is thinking, obviously I cannot say what the neurotypicals are thinking, but when it comes to you can make one small change to help accommodate to everyone, it feels like when we look at that, we're looking at the project as a whole and seeing that because some people have to do extra work to keep up. It's slowing the whole project down. It feels like possibly because we're the ones having to put in extra work, we see that and try to like divide the workforce so that everyone's doing just a bit extra to make it more efficient in the long run, but they're not seeing that. That references back to the idea that I was coming up with earlier, that if everyone put in about 5% more effort, then mm -hmm. the amount of inclusion would go up significantly, but they don't. So that means we, the neurodivergent people have to do 90% of the accommodation. We have to adjust for the sounds, the frequencies, the lights and so forth that mm. is typical. And we have to do the language interpretation and concept interpretation for the neurotypical so they understand us. And we then also have to do things so that we can talk to them, they can talk to us. We're doing both halves of the translation. Yeah. The thing I would ask for neurotypicals watching this is to recognize that some of the people you're going to work with have different sensory or conceptual ideas. Think of them as maybe coming from a different country. They know a lot, but some things aren't obvious and they are having to think more carefully about the words they choose so you understand be a little accommodating of that be a little understanding be patient try to hear what they're trying to say and give support where reasonable in a mature and not belittling way when you mm -hmm. say oh you know another way you could have put that is this because most neurodivergent people when given a better rule for doing something will go well that makes sense i'll do it that way now yeah there are yeah. some neurodivergent people who have got jaded and given up trying to change or accommodate or grow and they're just like mm, 
tough. Your problem, not mine. Mm. I have a great example. I've found that if I'm doing something the way that I found that it's the easy way to do it for me, and then someone comes and says, hey, what if you do it this way? Because it might be faster. I absolutely do not ever want to do it in that way. I'm a cashier sometimes, and one of my managers came over and said, before you give them their cups, you're supposed to fill it up with ice. I was like, I'm gonna do my hardest not to do that because I already have a habit and I don't want to change it. <laughs> That's partly to do with efficiency and comfort. Once you know a way that works, it's good mm -hmm. to stick with that way because it's become cheaper for you. However, if you slowly adjust that to be more efficient, it'll be comfortable. But if you do a big change, it's uncomfortable and it's a lot of effort to change again. Mm. Yeah, and I found that I did eventually get used to it because I slowly worked myself to doing yeah. it. But right at the beginning when the manager was like, you're doing it wrong. I was like, I don't want to change the way I'm doing it. Well, they found a way that works. That sounds yeah. a lot like the dishes thing. Like if you've been meaning to do the dishes oh. and someone says you should go do the dishes now, can't anymore. If I ask you, would you like a hot beverage such as coffee? You might say, yeah, I do. If you have happen to feel like a hot beverage and I say you are going to drink this coffee right now the your likely answer you're going to give me is no you can't mm. tell me what to do yeah. so sometimes we're just you know stubborn we're human that way that ties back to advertising I've been finding a lot that I hear ads and I'm like well now I know that that's a product that exists but I'm never gonna touch it and a lot of my friends also are like I have heard an ad they will never have me as a customer and I wonder how much of that is neurodivergence instead of a generation thing because I thought it was a generational thing but it's just occurred to me that all my friends are also neurodivergent. It's really hard to find token neurotypicals to find out how they behave. Oh, um, right. Sales <laughs> suggest that advertising works for most people so that's why they keep advertising and the people that don't mm. advertise don't get their products sold so clearly it works clearly it's a smart thing to do but I suspect when a lot of the sales pitch in advertising is geared towards if you want to be sexy you've got to do this thing there are a large quantity of neurodivergent people it's like but I don't want to be that image of perfection that you're painting because yeah. I don't fit your picture so and no and also on that same note as an asexual person I look at a lot of advertising that is sexualized because putting a bottle of soda in the hands of a pretty girl in a bikini by the side of the pool makes everyone go, oh, I want that soda, apparently. It makes me think in so many different ways. What's going on here? What? Why? <laughs> What's going on? The asexual side means that sexualization makes me stop wanting the product. But then also when it's geared towards neurotypicals, the neurodivergency, like there's just so many levels. I'm also asexual and I'm actually like sex repulsed. So I get that same kind of thing where it's like, okay, you want me to buy this soda because it also brings hot lady. Hot lady? Nice, yes. cool, could go without. Yeah, Please yeah. stop putting this in my face right now. Your, your um, milkshake brings all the was... boys to the yards. But please, <laughs> please do not bring your milkshake over here. <laughs> My, my yard is pleasantly boy free. I feel like for an advertisement to get me in particular, it's got to be like an, is it all spice? What's? Old spice. Hang on. Old, old, old spice, spice are really like good. But yeah. there's like so much going on, it just keeps your attention. I own Old Spice just because of those commercials. Yeah, they're actually like really good commercials. More homework. If you're watching this and you have not watched an Old Spice commercial just for the cultural experience, go watch one. Is this a recent advertising series? Or was this the old ones with the guy who was <laughs> saying, look at your man, look at me? That one is the best yeah. one. I've recently gotten one that is a basketball fruit soap yeah, commercial like, it's like, oh this is a basketball <laughs> but it's a watermelon actually it's soap it's like, yeah hello yeah that one was pretty good but the like look at me i'm on a boat is is better this actually reminds me of a movie that i watched it's on netflix i can't remember the exact name but it has to do with this woman who is getting a unicorn so hang on i need to figure out what this is called it's narrow it down much <laughs> Can you tell i know <laughs> i know it's about an art student in like you know modern kind of days and the whole thing with it is that she's very different from everybody else she's kicked out of art school because she makes different art from other people oh out God. of the 
the norm. Uh, and she ends up finding herself in an advertising thing. It's Unicorn Store on Netflix. Ends up doing advertising. Except mm -hmm. her advertising tactics are much different than everybody else. Like, she is going into bright colors and fantasy aspects and mm. a brighter, colorful, more exciting life, while other people are like, here's the babes. Ooh, babes. And she actually ends up losing in the end because of the people there. They wanted the babes, not yeah. the fantasy aspect. And... I've always seen that movie, thought of myself, and thought of it as a whole kind of thing about autism and ADHD even. Mm. Even though it's not explicitly stated, and it's that same kind of thing. Yeah. You don't have to think that differently, the odds are. <laughs> Unicorn Store. It's a great movie. I love it. And I think that's a really good segue into one of the things that we wrote down last time that we wanted to talk about this time, which is media that we feel encapsulates or reflects upon our experiences, characters that we relate to and can use to explain our brains and our experiences to other people, but also like that, stories where like the plot is like, ah, that see, that's how I experience my life. This is one of my favorite topics, actually, just because yes. of how much it has done for me in being, you know, diagnosed really late and all of that stuff. For me, it was Newt Scamander mm -hmm. and the yes. doctor from Doctor Who, yes. um, specifically the 13th. But anyway, not the point. They just kind of show who you are and you're like, oh my gosh, there are other people that think this way. Yes. There are other people like me. And it just makes you feel so, so, ah, like mm -hmm. real. It makes you feel real. Yes. yes. And fun fact, Shay, with the Black Rock Chronicles. Which, yes! <laughs> so not to bring up the... <laughs> Not to bring up the Black Rock Chronicles. This was a Minecraft roleplay back from, well, Let's Play, I guess, back from 2012. It's my favorite thing, my biggest special interest kind of deal. One of the main characters, her name is Zoe, and I always mm -hmm. felt that we were kindred spirits, yes. you know? She had a different way of thinking, a different way of feeling, and it reflected mine, and I loved her. I... And it actually, sorry, it actually came to a point <laughs> where I caught one of her recent live streams. And I noticed that her Twitch was tagged with Neurodivergent and I started crying oh. because I know I started crying because I realized that this, the biggest inspiration in my life was the representation I didn't know that I needed all yeah. of this time. Like I, I am actually <laughs> tearing up because of that too. I know, me too. Zoe Same had, what you were going to say. I'm Zoe so had sorry. such an effect on me. No, it's fine. Cause you and I have that shared experience of watching the Black Rock Chronicles and finding that sort of kindred spirit in Zoe. When I was younger, I didn't like who I was. I didn't like the person that I had learned to be to survive in the society, the situation that I had found myself in. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I didn't know who I wanted to be. It was that whole thing of like, if life is a game, then I want to change my characters. Well, okay, just make a new character sheet. Ah, I hadn't thought that far. What do I want to be? So I looked to Zoe. And I found the parts of her character in the Black Rock Chronicles that I liked, that I felt the most connected to, that I felt most encapsulated my ideal version of self. And then I, uh, I, I kind of mimicked them and became like the person that I am now because I found that connection and that was when I had nothing else to go off of that was what I based my sense of self on yeah. in a world in which a lot of times in the real world around you you don't have a lot of people that are going to be like you media has always been so important to me that's why I'm doing this as my career that's yes. why um, I try and do the same thing for the people that follow me is because I know the importance of seeing somebody who mm -hmm. is like you in a and mind not just kind like of way. you, but doing okay, doing well, showing yes. how to be. As we're growing up in school and looking at society and watching media and so forth, we are given these templates of how to be a human being, but they're generally framed in form of this is how you be a neurotypical human being. That's and super useful. Thanks, society. That's really useful for a lot of people so they know what to do, how to be. If you want to be an electrician, this is how you get there this is what you do this is the typical way of getting there this is what you have to achieve and so forth uh, you want to be successful get married have children buy a house get a car 
work your life, retire. This is the typical template. This is how you do it. That doesn't work for all people. And neurodivergent peoples often find that the standard template doesn't work well. And when we look at media, we don't see ourselves represented there, much like most minority groups. You feel like this doesn't really speak to me or of me or about me. So where do I fit? Who am I? Am I wrong? Am I doing it wrong? So when we see representation in media, we can see oh, I'm not alone. And we can see other people who have done things differently that we can align with. And even if I don't want to follow how you did it, just the fact that you've done it differently allows me to do my life differently. And that mm. gives us templates to adjust and adapt from. And that's really powerful. Star Trek was one of the series that helped me recognize that like Spock, I liked to think my way through problems. And like Spock, I had insanely intense emotions that I experienced, but tried not to live my life following. One of the common mistakes that uh, people make about the Vulcan species in the Star Trek universe is that they think that the Vulcans are unemotional, and that's not true. They're insanely emotional. They just recognize that if they followed what their emotions said, they'd destroy themselves. So they came up with a logic system to supersede it. They mm. experience their emotions, and then they make a choice based on logic, yeah. rationality. And here was I using that similar technique to compensate for my incredibly strong emotions, often thinking that my emotions were a fault and error, rather than, as one of my therapists pointed out to me at some point, it's okay to be passionate, just don't lose yourself in the passion. That was quite a turning point for me. Data was another person who was trying to understand what it was like to be human and to emulate humans whilst always knowing that they weren't human. Yeah. And that was very powerful for me too. But there are also quite a few other characters represented in the next generation for Star Trek that I could align with that were always the oddities, the weirdos, the outliers. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Doctor Who, I've uh, aligned with every doctor that has occurred and gone, oh yes, there I am in each and every one of them. But I found it hilarious that the 12th doctor played by Peter Capaldi uh, at one point was using cue cards to try to prompt him how to human. Oh, I am sorry for your loss. That must be hard. Another character that uses cue cards to try to prompt and uh, puts logic way over emotions is Logan Sanders from Sanders Sides, aka Logic. He is the part of the brain that encompasses logic. He is very routine-oriented and schedule-oriented and takes things very literally. And there are a lot of other autistic people who... Dad, you have zombies coming for you. There are a lot of other autistic people who relate to him. On the note of Spock, I want to take a moment to appreciate the fact that, as far as I'm aware, the original actor didn't realize or didn't intend to... Leonard Nimoy, the actor, did not yeah. recognize that he was an inspiration for autistic people. Oh. And quite a few of the Star Trek actors have not understood what they mean to people until it was pointed out to them, which has led to some of them specifically adding in neurodivergent features to mm -hmm. their characters and encouraging the scriptwriters to add to that in order to be inclusive, which I have loved. Yeah, that's what I wanted to point out. The fact that some of them, once they realized that they were an inspiration and they were an example, did research and strove for better representation because the representation's already there. People already relate and connect to this character. So let's do what we can to make it even better than it already is. And that is so powerful. That is so important. <sighs> Something really funny that I have noticed is the difference between the characters that they have either accidentally made neurodivergent or something like that, and the characters that they purposefully made neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I, for one, always relate more to the accidental neurodivergent ones, because yeah. I feel like the ones that they do on purpose relies so heavily on stereotypes. Oh, um, bad and the painful tropes, oh, yes. yeah. Especially if they're not made by neurodivergent people. There is a character who is clearly autistic coded in both the books and the show that they made that follows enough of the tropes that you can tell by looking at them that this person is meant to be. But I didn't feel alienated. Uh, it's David Kostyuk from uh, 
the Grisha verse, which on Netflix is Shadow and Bug. David is very clearly autistic coded. He's an engineer. He does this whole thing where he doesn't think inside the norm. He invents things that no one else ever has because it's cool. It, it, it's cool, why. and he sees a problem, knows that it can be solved, and figures out how to solve it. And I was really impressed when I saw the Netflix adaptation because I was looking at the actor and going, oh, you know what you're doing. Either they got an autistic actor, or the actor seriously studied up about how to do good representation. Because, yeah, sure, there are a few things that it's like, hmm, that's a little tropey. But looking at the body language of the actor and the ways that the actor slash character were avoiding eye contact in the visual medium, I saw myself. It was actually good representation, which is really important. I'm really excited for future seasons of that show in particular because yes. one of my favorite um, characters from the Six of Crows books that I highly believe is Neurodivergent, Wylan, Wylan. has not been included yet. And I, I'm really interested to see how, how they go about uh, playing that character. I, I know that next season has Wylan and Nikolai, who are both A, absolutely incredible, B, inventors, C, absolutely neurodivergent. What is up with all these people being inventors and neurodivergent? Why am I noticing a trend? Because yes. we think people outside of the box. Think, you know, what box? Yeah. There was a box. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me about a box. I must have missed a memo. I thought our brain was, like, round. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, because I'm not an expert on what other people are thinking, just patterns. A lot of times when people are trying to write stories about odd people, they will accidentally describe a neurodivergent person. And often the writers themselves that I've heard interviews with have said, oh, yes, I base this on a few people I know, mm -hmm. without necessarily realizing that the person that they base it on is a neurodivergent person. And that person that it was based on may not know themselves. So it's not uncommon for people to not have a clue. Here I am at 40, uh, well, 47 now, having slowly worked out what the heck is up with my brain. Yeah. Knew but... it was different, didn't know why. That's one of the things I'm really loving about the Minecraft community. A lot of the younger or smaller creators, like a lot of the people in this call, know that they are neurodivergent and know what that means. But then I look at some of the big creators and I have to wonder, do they, do they know? Like, some of them do. Dream, Techno, Carl, Jacobs, they all talk about their ADHD. They're all open about the fact that they have ADHD. But there are a number of other creators that I watch and I'm not going to name them because they haven't talked about it and they might not know and that's their business. But when they talk about the ways that they produce things, their editing schedule or had their recording schedule, even the way that they play the game. I can't help but look at that and think, do you know how much you sound like me right now? Are you aware? And I think getting that representation, even if they don't know they're giving the representation, is one of the things that I really love about this community. And that's one of the very valuable things about what we are doing here is we are talking openly about how did we know? How did we find out? How did we figure this out? Mm -hmm. And if you're listening to this and you're going, wow, a lot of this sounds awfully familiar and you don't know, have some consideration. Maybe what's going on is you are like us. And it may not be autism or ADHD, but it's likely to be something atypical, divergent, different. You're mm -hmm. not alone. There are words to describe these things. In the last one, I was talking about boxes. That is, it's nice to find a box that you fit, but if someone tries to shove you into a box that you don't think is good for you or might even be accurate, you will resist like a cat. Knowing which box you fit closely enough to that it makes sense of the world can be incredibly liberating and to know that you're not alone despite the fact that there's no one like you in school. Yeah, there are times when everyone around a person is like, hey, this neurodivergence thing really fits you. I think you have ADHD. They're doctors, they're therapists, they're friends. If they're not willing to accept it, it's not gonna work. It's that whole thing of accepting you need help is the first step. If you're not ready to confront something, 
it's not going to happen. There's also a lot of stigma behind some of these words. So when I was in school, both primary and high school, autism was the word used to describe that kid in the corner that was rocking back and forth screaming and had someone trying to shush them. I don't want to be that. That's not me. Yeah, technically it is. There are times where I have been dysfunctional and I have you know, hid in the corner and tried screaming very quietly to myself because I just could no longer function. Yeah. But to, to think that because of the way society defines autism based on its dysfunction, it only views autism as dysfunctional. It doesn't recognize that the technology we use is built by autistic people, that the developments and most of your emergency service people have ADHD. Most creative people in the arts or creating new solutions to weird problems have ADHD and or autism. Yeah. So without us, your society is kind of boring. Enjoy that rock painting that we did but you can't get out of the rock caves because, you know, we didn't invent it for you. So yeah. the technology society has is based on the people who thought different, not the people who thought the same. And the neurotypicals are then caught up. But because there's more of them, it's their world, right? Yeah. Oh, I knew I had a point here. I've lost it. <laughs> Sorry. It's amazing how much of that experience of the stigma stopping us from accepting who we are, learning about that, and coming to fruition. It's amazing how many of those experiences are shared with the queer ones, with the gay especially having been used as an insult. There are so many gay people who would not accept that they were gay because that's the thing that you bully someone for. Everyone gets bullied for that. I don't want that to be me. And yeah wow pain is you... self-denial because the perception of yourself you have is through someone's stigmatized lens yeah. and you don't want to be in that box because people have told you that box is awful but once you see what that box actually contains not just the stigma version of that box you start realizing how beautiful that box is how yeah. amazing that box is and how less lonely it is to recognize ah you you are my people and you aren't horrible the people who said that adhd people are all nightmares just haven't met the right adhd people mm -hmm. and then the ones who are nightmares we've got to ask why what's going on what support are you missing what understanding are you missing such that you can be a decent and genuine you yeah. Very few people want to be nasty. Some of them just don't have the support that they need to feel okay or to function. Some people's brains don't make the right chemicals to produce happiness all of the time. And that can be depression. Some people's, <laughs> some people's bodies and brains don't work in the typical way and they need extra support. They need medication or a walking aid in order to navigate this world the or way glasses. that it was designed to. Or glasses, yeah. If someone needs a walking aid, that can be a visual thing. It's not always a visual thing because sometimes it's the fact that they get exhausted more quickly. It's not a limp or a lack of being able to physically take the steps without aid. When it comes so to your brain... You can't do much if you don't have more support. Yeah. When it comes to your brain, it can be harder to tell, especially because it's... It's internal, not external, so it's not something other people can spot, but it's also not something you can spot because you can't see how their brains are working, so you can't see what's different with yours. One of my clients recently asked me, do I really have anxiety if I can sometimes consciously still my fears? And I said, yes, just because you can sometimes for a little while still your anxiety doesn't mean you no longer have anxiety. Consider breathing. It works best when you go both in and out. <laughs> if you choose to, you can stop breathing for a while. Your body has about five minutes worth of oxygen stored in it. So you should be able to hold your breath for a good five minutes. Usually at about 60 to 90 seconds into that five minutes, your brain is saying, I, I don't care that I've got more, I'm going to breathe. And it will override you unless you've done some special training to not. Your biology kicks in, but you can still it for a while. Yeah. But you can't override it for long. And so being able to quell your fears for a few minutes, maybe half an hour, when your biology is set for be scared, do you have anxiety? Mm -hmm. There are some things you can do about that. Sometimes medication helps. 
often therapy helps it depends on your brain just because you can override the fear in this moment doesn't mean you're cured yeah it doesn't mean that it's an illusion it doesn't mean that you're faking it it doesn't mean that you're exaggerating your normal fears it just means well done you've held your breath for a bit now you need to breathe again which means returning to the status quo which for you might be anxiety yeah until you can work out why you're anxious and that can be similar for things like uh drinking addiction you're not drinking alcohol just because it's tasty and you're bored though many people do that and that's just regular consumption if you're addicted to alcohol it's serving a purpose and until you work out what that purpose is you can't stop drinking for long Mm. you've got to address the deeper purpose it's not a moral failing something's gone wrong we're using alcohol to manage it work out what's gone wrong it could be biological it could be traumatic it could be something else that's where a good therapist is going to help you work out what is that thing address that and then you can stop drinking sometimes what you think is the problem is just a symptom of the problem Yes. And you have to address the cause before you can fix the thing that you thought you were coming to fix. Yeah. I'm excited because I, I can say something about this. Okay, Ooh. so <laughs> that's actually the exact case uh, for when I first started doing therapy was because I was depressed all the time and I didn't know why. I just knew that I just didn't want to exist anymore. And it took a very long time before I was like, Oh, well, I have depression and anxiety, but those are the side effects of being trans and not knowing it and ADHD and not knowing how to function and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And once you've worked out what's behind the experience, you can address that. And now you don't have to use that mechanism to cope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So often anxiety is a tool that autistic and ADHD brains use to be able to function, to get through scenarios that are uncomfortable for you, to get enough dopamine. Not all people with anxiety and depression are autistic or ADHDers, but many are. And too often it's glossed over and overlooked and ignored because we don't want to give you that label if it's not correct and that is true don't give it if it's not correct but at least consider it too few therapists in my opinion consider are we dealing with autism yet are we dealing with adhd maybe we should check these things because if that's what's going on and driving the anxiety the depression and the other the suicidal ideation the self-harm and so forth shouldn't we actually treat the right thing not the wrong thing yeah well most people with self-harm have trauma in their past look at society most people have had trauma in their past Mm -hmm. but most people aren't self-harming so why is it that some do maybe correlation is not causation maybe trauma is a part of it but not the cause maybe it's undiagnosed adhd maybe it's being a trans person in a society that keeps telling you that you were born this way and that's all you've got or we tell you that because you have these external features you must behave this way and that doesn't feel right and lying to yourself and living a false life is what's driving you crazy yeah it's got to look for those deeper causes it's not what's wrong it's a sign that something's wrong yes I think one of the biggest issues is how hesitant people are to diagnose people with the more heavy things. I feel like it's a lot easier to diagnose people with anxiety and depression than to actually look deeper into it because of the stigma that we were talking about earlier. A lot of people that I've gone to get diagnosed with have been hesitant because they don't want to put that on me. When in reality, when I finally got the actual diagnosis, it was a breath of fresh air. It was relief in realizing that what you've just like what you've gone through your whole life isn't because you are faulty it's not yeah. because you're bad yeah. it's yeah. because of how you operate who you are yeah. there's some serious validation behind finally having the right terms it can feel like permission to be you even though you don't need permission to function the way you do knowing yeah, you're not alone told. is so powerful We've been told so frequently, don't be you, be like us. And yeah. so knowing that you aren't like them makes it a lot easier to go, yeah, apparently I don't do it your way. Mm-hmm. But you're right. Schools, for example, are very reluctant to put anything on the official record to help guide teachers about how to help you be a student in the school because they don't want to label kids. You know, we don't want that on their official permanent record. Um, As someone who is now 
old. No one, as far as I'm aware, has gone back to my school to look at my record. So if this thing on the record helps the teachers consistently recognize that, oh, wait, I actually need this support, like being able to leave the room when I'm anxious so that I can gather myself, come back in and not disrupt the other kids. How about we do that and allow for that? Stop <laughs> worrying about the, the oh, well, we, we don't want to label kids. Look, it's already affecting me. Can we just make it like official now? Please. <laughs> Please. Yeah. So that I appreciate you've given me permission to walk outside of the class, but the teacher over there doesn't want to give me that permission, even though I have it from the principal. If it's on my official record, then I can say, yes. look at my student record. I am allowed to do this. You can't stop me. Mm -hmm. And if the teacher tries to stop you, you can now report them. And there are consequences to teachers who are interfering with your mental health. Yeah. But without it that, really all, nothing. it really all goes back again to that stigma, just because they think that if you put it on that permanent, like your permanent record, if you will, that what you're going to lose opportunities no. in the future. Oh, that you're going to lose opportunities in the future. But now let's dissect that. Why would we then lose those opportunities? That's yep. a whole other issue. It's so many layers of things of how kind of crappy we are treated. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times. I mean, if anything, actually getting diagnosed early, which is basically having someone say, by the way, this is a true fact about you. Being diagnosed early allows you to make reasonable adjustments to your lifestyle that allows teachers and schools to help you become a more capable adultier you. Mm -hmm. And they are saying, we don't want to stigmatize you. Well, that whole not want to acknowledge that this thing is real, that this affects me is stigmatizing me, forcing me to be other than me that's stigmatizing me you're telling me that me as i am naturally is wrong yeah that's the stigma that it's not putting it on my record and having people know it's telling me i can't be me that i have to be you sorry a bit ranty today but that's a valid rant more than a valid rant one that i think we've all had to have at one point or another so as a therapist i am frequently helping youth and sometimes adults find out who they are that there is a box and a label that you can fit into that the box is actually quite loosely defined because of the spectrum and both adhd and autism the spectrum and some other conditions that may be relevant and number of times parents are highly resistant to finding out that this thing about their kid is true, that this explains so much, is, astounds me. By the same token, there are also some amazing parents who were like, oh, that makes so much sense. Great, we can do something with that. Thank you for telling us. I mean, that's awesome. Then the problem comes in with getting confirmation because I'm able to recognize the traits and I'm able to support people in what to do with the traits, but I cannot give an official diagnosis. That's not within my degree. So I then have to refer the client on to someone who can do that, which is often in Australia, a psychologist psychiatrist private for ADHD and that's expensive which means that anyone who's poor can't get it or a clinical psychologist and speech pathologist in tandem for an autism diagnosis and that's incredibly expensive so as an example of the expense I have a client at the moment who is in that awkward youth stage where pediatricians won't be able to see them before they actually age out and can't be seen by a pediatrician for a cheap public funded diagnosis. So they have to go private. That's going to cost about $800 minimum. And now that the family knows what they're looking at, they've recognized that each member of the family, and there's five kids and two adults, all would benefit from this same diagnosis for ADHD and autism. So that's $800 each plus two and a half grand each. Someone did the math. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, it was a broken leg, it's free here in Australia. You get that diagnosis, you even get the repair free. Why is some important feature about you so expensive to find out, get confirmation so other people take it seriously? It really shouldn't be. Not to mention the complexity involved in getting an ADHD diagnosis. I mean, the uh, primary feature of ADHD is executive dysfunction. That is, 
tasks are hard to do, especially if it's complicated and takes time. That doesn't make you stupid. That just means that it's hard to do the thing and it's hard to stay focused on the thing. So how do you get an ADHD diagnosis? Well, first of all, you have to show enough traits that someone goes, oh, by the way, this could be ADHD. You then need to go get that letter sent to your doctor to confirm, by the way, I think we should get that referral. Speaking here of Australia, of course. The doctor, the GP, will then send a referral off to a psychiatrist who may or may not take on your case. And they may or may not tell you they didn't. If they do take on your case, they'll probably call you sometime in the next two, three, four weeks and make an appointment for somewhere between four to six months from now. In the meantime, you need to save up enough money if you didn't have to pay a deposit to be able to go see them. And then you have to turn up on the right day at the right place on the right time to be seen. You then have to demonstrate to the psychiatrist that yes, actually you do have enough features that it's worth doing. And sometimes you need to have brought your school records with you if you're an adult to prove that this isn't a recent thing. Yeah. Finding school records, that's complicated, especially if you're my age. And showing up on time to get an ADHD diagnosis, where one of the common things that it prohibits you from being able to do to the standard that this society would like like is time management. Mm -hmm. Then you need to get a blood test and you can't need to come back a month later and should everything check out then maybe you can get some medication to help you with all those problems you had getting the medication. Just wow. seems a bit Yay. hard. So congratulations. Not only is it expensive so you can't get it if you're poor, it's really complicated and difficult and it deals with one of the biggest problems ADHD is commonly have, which is things in the future are hard to manage. To jump through so many goalposts to do the basic things that we need to do. And that's not just getting a diagnosis, that's going to an appointment, whether that be for diagnosis or just a doctor's appointment or a job interview or something you're working on for school where you have like a, a supervisor who's supposed to be helping you manage this thing so you're not doing it on your own. This is something that seriously affects every part of our lives. Schoolwork, day-to-day -day things. Heck, going to the shopping center is affected by neurodivergence. Yeah. It is all encompassing. The number of times I get milk I don't need because I think, do I have any milk? I better get some just in case. Lucky it's covered milk, so it'll last. Yeah. Um, or I end up with dozens of tins of tomatoes in the cupboard. What is covered? I'm sorry, what's my dad? Milk? My dad's vegan, so it's soy milk. Which means it doesn't. It's okay to like keep it in a uh, long life carton, covered soy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, right. My apologies. Okay. I was. I was <laughs> My going apologies, to, international people. I, I, um. I, I was gonna do a thing when you stopped talking because I I could feel the confusion in the air there. <laughs> Yep, so shopping. Fortunately, online lists help. Mm -hmm. I've got to say, time sense works so much better now that I have an online calendar that synchronizes with multiple devices. And with so, multiple and, people. And multiple people to manage multiple things, all who squirrel all over the place. Oh my god, our household is a mess. I love them. But what do you use for that? Um, I use uh, Google Calendar because I can allow other people with Gmail accounts to see select information and not other information. Uh, like, for example, my work appointments. I obviously don't want to put my my clients' names on the internet, so uh, it's all blanked out, but people know I'm busy times blocked out. I can set an appointment that's clearly just for me, and I can set one that is for the whole family, and I can also tag Shay Laura in so that if they ever look at their calendar, they'll go, oh, that's where it is. Um, you know, I should really start looking at my calendar. That sounds like a, a useful and helpful thing to do. Mm. That's another oh. thing of me having problems adjusting with things that would make my life easier. <laughs> yeah. Whole family was like, hey, we should get calendars because four of us are going to college now. And then I'm like, yeah, that would sound like a good idea. And then could never get myself adjusted to using it. Yeah. I have dozens of good ideas every day and every couple of weeks I'll do this. Six impossible things before breakfast. So that's the sort of vibe that gives. Now, we are hitting the end of our allotted time, so is there anything we want to touch on? Anything you desperately want to talk about before we stop recording? Just needs to be said, these things that we deal with with neurodivergence, it's all encompassing. Please, maybe have some patience. Yes, <laughs> you have a neurodivergent friend and you're like, wow, you talk about this a lot. Yes, it's almost like it affects every part of my life and also all of my thoughts. And once you realize what's going on, 
to tell everyone. And once you start knowing what it looks like, it's hard not to see and then you kind of wanting to tell everyone, oh, by the way, did you know that you lead people carefully? Uh, it's, it's rude to out people. But recommend this video because then people go, oh, that makes more sense. It's not your job to tell people who they are. It's your job to help them find out. That's why we make the videos. This has been a lot of fun, guys. Thank you Yay. so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. I appreciate you all very much. You are all incredibly cool. Hopefully we can do another thing like this in the not-too-distant future.